All right, folks, I uh, hope everybody's doing well. And here we go with uh, the material in Chapter 11, which is about marketing. And so um, I usually like to start this uh, uh, lesson by having people imagine that they're about to throw this wonderful party, uh, maybe a celebration, a birthday, or an anniversary, or, uh, you know, who knows what. And so you, you know, do a lot of planning in advance, and uh, you've got everything uh, all perfect. You've got the venue, you've got the food, you've got the invitations. Um, everything is just, uh, you're just ready for the guests to come, and, you know, lo and behold, uh, the night of the party, the time comes, and nobody shows up. Imagine how disappointed you'd be. And so, uh, you know, marketing is all about, uh, you know, letting people know about things and letting people know about things that are of value to them so that they make a decision to participate. And so, uh, you know, we're going to spend some time talking about uh, marketing. I'm not an expert in marketing, but uh, in terms of health promotion, there are certainly some things that we want to do and, and not do in order to be successful. Okay, so here's our uh, learning objectives for today, um, or for this week. So I want you to be able to define market, marketing, and social marketing, uh, explain the, the concept of exchange in marketing, uh, describe uh, segmentation, where we you know, take a priority population and break it up into different segments um, and tailor our messages to those different segments. Uh, list and explain the factors that are used to segment an audience, explain what's called dis diffusion theory, and explain how diffusion theory can be used to market a health promotion program. Uh, explain the relationship between a needs assessment, which we've already looked at, and a social marketing program. And then uh, finally, probably the most important takeaway from this lesson is what's called the marketing mix or the four P's of marketing. And so here's some terminology to be on the lookout for as you go through the lesson and do the readings. Um, and I'll let you uh, take a look at these. I won't bother to read them all to you. Okay, so uh, what's a market? So a market is the set of all the people who have an actual or potential interest in a product or a service that you're uh, promoting. Uh, and so you know, we, we can think about uh, a community as being a potential market or a particular neighborhood in a community or a segment of the community. Uh, but uh, the market is basically anybody who has the potential to be interested in what it is that we're offering, whether that's some kind of tangible good or a service. And so marketing is the planned attempt to influence uh, the voluntary exchange of transactions um, and so between buyers and sellers or between providers and consumers. So marketing is different from selling and that selling concentrates on the needs of the producer. In other words, uh, you know, I'm trying to make money, I'm trying to sell more products, whereas marketing focuses more on the needs of the uh, consumer or the public. So, you know, cutting to the chase, uh, if we, you know, uh, strip away all the fancy language, marketing comes down to offering a benefit that an identified group of potential customers will pay a price for and be satisfied with. And when we talk about price, you know, price is not necessarily just the money that we lay down on the table for something, but it is, uh, you know, also what it costs us in terms of time, energy, and effort to participate as well. Okay, so here's a uh, balance scale that uh, kind of explains visually the, the uh, cost-benefit exchange. And so if somebody is marketing something to me, you know, let's say it's a, um, um, a mammogram. Um, so, you know, I have to decide whether or not I'm going to, you know, take advantage of that. And so I'm going to weigh the costs, of, uh, what's it going to cost me versus what benefits am I going to get from that. You know, we do this every day when we think about buying a product. So, um, you know, if you're in a store and you need makeup, for example, um, you know, how badly do you need that? What's that going to do for you if you if you buy it versus how much does it cost to do that? And so, you know, we're always constantly weighing the, the costs and the benefits. And uh, presumably when the uh, costs outweigh the benefits, then we don't act. When the benefits outweigh the costs, we're more likely to, uh, to act. So think about uh, something like uh, smoking cessation. 
So, you know, what would be the benefits to quitting smoking versus the costs of quitting smoking? So I'll get, let you think about that for a second. So some of the benefits might be uh, better health, uh, you know, a longer life, uh, maybe, um, um, you know, maybe uh, better family relations. You know, maybe some of your family members are uh, getting after you about smoking and uh, uh, maybe some of the grandkids are not wanting to come around the house anymore because the house smells and, and that sort of thing. So, um, Obviously, if you if you don't smoke, you're not paying for cigarettes, uh, and so there's you know an economic benefit there, versus the costs. And you know again, costs are not necessarily uh, uh, monetary, but uh, you know what are what are going to be some of the costs of uh, engaging in smoking cessation? Well, you know there might be the real cost of buying um, smoking cessation products, whether they're patches or medications. Uh, there could be, you know, time invested in going to a smoking cessation class. Uh, there could be, you know, perceived um, uh, loss of, of some sort of status. You know, if, if uh, smoking is something that makes me feel good or, you know, I think that makes me look good, then, you know, there's a potential uh, cost there or loss. Uh, maybe I enjoy smoking with colleagues during breaks, and there's sort of a social thing going on there. And so if I stop smoking, am I going to lose that? Am I going to lose those friends? So, you know, all of those things, it's, it's, we're always weighing the, the benefits for the costs or versus the costs um, in determining whether or not to take action. All right, so social marketing is a little bit different than, uh, you know, marketing some sort of a tangible product. Social marketing is usually focusing on ideas, uh, attitudes, lifestyle changes, things like that. So, um, you know, we're not necessarily uh, marketing a, a good or a service, but we are marketing, um, you know, more intangible things. And so some examples of tangible versus intangible products and services you know, in terms of uh, health promotion, uh, you know, marketing mosquito nets, obviously that's tangible, contraceptives, nutrition supplements, fruits and vegetables, bike helmets, medicine, and so on and so forth, uh, testings or screenings, mammography, prostate cancer screenings, uh, eye screens, you know, those kinds of things are tangible products or services, as opposed to intangible things, you know, do this and you'll have a better quality of life. Do this and you'll be uh, more satisfied. You'll have a feeling of self-confidence or self-efficacy. Uh, insurance, when we purchase insurance, is that something that's tangible or intangible? Well, why do we do it? We do it so that we have peace of mind that, uh, you know, that's going to be there for us uh, if we uh, ultimately need it. And education, um, you know, what, you know, what is an education? Can you see it? Can you feel it? Can you touch it? No, but you, you know, you come away with it and it leads to hopefully, uh, you know, other things. Um, an image, uh, you know, uh, Madison Avenue is always trying to sell us an image. You know, if you drive this car, if you buy this uh, this dress, if you, um, you know, uh, you know, purchase this particular brand of cigarette. You know, there's an image that they're trying to sell that goes along with that. And then attitudes and lifestyles. You know, those are intangible things as well. That uh, you know, we're trying to get somebody to do something to take action. Uh, that's going to improve their life, and we do that through social marketing. Okay, so here's something that, uh, you know, marketers uh, pay attention to. It's what's called diffusion theory, and it represents the pattern of adoption of something in, a, in the priority population. And so how long does it take for something to actually um, get into uh, public practice or, you know, in terms of a tangible good, how long does it take for people to actually uh, adopt purchase and adopt that um, particular item. And so here's a, here's a quiz for you. Um, I want you to, to ask yourself which category that you fall into here. Uh, and I've got a picture up here of a new, um, new technology, the, you know, the Apple Watch. I don't know how many of you have an Apple Watch. I guess as I've walked around the room, I've seen a few of them. Um, but it's fairly new. Um, <laughs> 
you know, people have joked that, you know, Apple spent uh, a lot of years telling us that we didn't need a watch because everything that we needed was on our phone. And now they're telling us that we really don't need a phone or a computer. Everything, uh, you know, we can do everything on this new watch that they're trying to get us to buy. And so, okay, so when a new uh, product comes on the market, you know, which category do you feel like you fall into? Are you the kind of person that camps out at the store? Uh, you want to be the first in line to buy the product? Um, or are you the kind of person who's going to wait a little bit to see if purchasers, early purchasers are satisfied with the product before you, you jump in and buy? Or are you going to wait until uh, supply catches up with demand and the product uh, goes on sale or the price drops a little bit? Or uh, D, are you going to wait until the next generation of the product is about to launch and so the price drops significantly? So each of these uh, categories has a name in terms of um, a, a marking. And so the innovators, uh, less than 3% are the individuals that are those folks that are, you know, they're first in line. They've got to have this thing. They don't care about the cost. Uh, they want to be the first. A little bit later, uh, about 14% of the population can be classified as early adopters. They're going to wait a little bit, but uh, they want to be, you know, reasonably early on in the process. And then a little bit later, you've got the early majority, 34%. Um, and you might recognize these numbers. Uh, they kind of go along with the normal curve. And, um, you know, these numbers represent the area under the curve so that the most people are here in the middle, uh, the greatest area representing the greatest number of adopters, and then uh, towards either end, of course, fewer and fewer. So you've got the early majority, about 34%, a little bit later on in the process, the late majority, another 34%, and then the laggards are those folks who are uh, really late to the party. Uh, they're going to wait quite a while to see you know, what's going on with the product, you know, probably to see if people are satisfied with it, if there you know, really are benefits to it, and probably that the price needs to drop significantly before they make the decision to purchase. So again, here are the categories, your innovators, less than 3% of the population, your early adopters, very interested in the innovation, but not the first to sign up, your early majority, uh, they're interested in the product, but they need some sort of external motivation, they're going to deliberate for some time before they make a decision, your late majority are skeptical at first, uh, they're not necessarily going to adopt an innovation until most people have done so, and then as I said, the laggards are the last ones in, and um, you know, they uh, are going to be um, going to be the last to uh, adopt uh, an innovation or to purchase a product. And so here's another curve, uh, another graph that shows over time the um, sort of the percent of adopters um, as represented. This is called a, uh, an S curve or a spline curve. But uh, we've got the cumulative percent of adopters on the on the um, y-axis and time on the x-axis and so as we add these different uh, classifications of individuals that are adopting the product or taking advantage of the service uh, and here we get to uh, you know saturation point of about 75 percent or so all right so uh, marketing and health promotion you know how do we use marketing and health promotion uh, well, it involves using marketing research to determine the needs and desires of the uh, potential priority population, our clients. Um, we develop a product that satisfies or meets those needs, and then we develop uh, informative and per persuasive communication to try to get people to take advantage of what it is that we're trying to offer. Uh, we're trying to ensure that the product is provided in the appropriate form at the right time and place and at the best price. And what we want to do is we want to uh, make our clients satisfied in, in what uh, we're offering. You know, that's, that's where our evaluation comes in. And our sustainability plan, we want them to uh, continue to take advantage of the product uh, after their exchange has taken place. Um, you know, salespeople you call this service after the sale. They want to keep you coming back um, for more. All right, so let's look at uh, a few marketing examples. Uh, this is always kind of fun to look at. Um, the uh, 
Central Georgia Cancer Coalition was uh, trying to get African-American men to get screened for prostate cancer. And so what they did was they went to a, uh, a health promotion class or a marketing class, I don't know which it was, at the University of Georgia and, and tasked the uh, students to come up with a uh, social marketing campaign to try to encourage African-American men to get screened for prostate cancer. And I want to show you a couple of examples of what they came up with. Okay, so here's the first one. So it's a, uh, you know, a bride who's about to walk down the aisle on her wedding day and her father is not there. Um, and so the, uh, the message here is that 705 dads could miss her big day this year. Well, why 705? Well, 705 because that's the number of, uh, of people that die each year uh, in Georgia uh, from prostate cancer. And so the message is get screened early and get back in the picture brought to you by the Central Georgia Cancer Coalition. Okay, so, you know, what do you think about this? So let's look at the next one. Similar kind of thing, again, we have the idea of the, the number 705. Um, so prostate cancer could ruin 705 games of catch this year. So get screened early and get back in the game. So you've got a a uh, young boy here with his ball glove and a uh, father is not in the picture because um, he prostate cancer has presumably uh, taken his life. All right, well, um, you know, I imagine that uh, uh, thinking back to what the purpose of this was, that probably immediately what you've said is there are no African-American people in these pictures. <laughs> And so while it may seem obvious to you, evidently it wasn't obvious enough to the uh, people that were doing the, the students uh, that were doing the marketing campaign. And so uh, that was a major flaw. So, um, you know, when, when we're trying to market something to a particular population, we want to make sure that they can relate to it. And so, uh, you know, here was what we actually came up with. And I can remember seeing these on billboards around the Macon area. And so, uh, you know, this was the, the ultimate um, um, winner, so to speak, or the one that uh, was chosen. But it says prostate cancer, the best defense is a good offense. And so you have a picture of an African-American gentleman here sitting on uh, some bleachers, uh, having played a game of basketball, uh, you know, fairly healthy, athletic looking individual. Um, so, you know, that per kind of person might think, hey, well, I'm healthy. There's no reason for me to do this. But the message is people of, of that particular age uh, and um, um, uh, race, you know, need to get screened every year. And so, again, sponsored by the Central Georgia Cancer Coalition and the Medical Center of Central Georgia. All right, so now we get to what's called the marketing mix or the four P's of marketing. Uh, you know, these are back in the terminology page, but the four P's are product, price, placement, and promotion. You need to commit those to memory. So the product is the actual program that you're planning or the service that you're offering. Um, and so there are several categories of, of, uh, of product. Uh, it could be, you know, the communication of information so information that tries to get people to take action on something. Um, it could be a tangible product. Uh, you know, maybe you're trying to get people to use condoms, uh, trying to get people to adopt a particular uh, curriculum for health education. You know, maybe you're marketing some videos that can be used for um, teaching people a particular health enhancing skill or it could be some sort of service delivery uh, you know like counseling screening um, hotline suicide hotline smoking cessation uh, quit lines things like that so those are some examples of products and so you know what about price okay when we think about price we often think about money so if we think about uh, are we going to charge something for this, or how much are we going to charge? Who are the clients? Uh, you know, what is their ability to pay? Are we working with low-income people or homeless people who you know don't have uh, any discretionary money, or are we working with folks that do have some ability to pay? Um, you know, maybe we want to offer our program or services on what's called a sliding scale, where 
uh, your bill, your um, how much you you pay is based on your ability to pay. So you know those individuals that have an income would pay a certain amount, and individuals who you know don't have much money would pay a much lesser amount. Are there co-payers involved? So is this something that would be covered by insurance, where a, an employer or um, you know a sponsoring organization would pay some of the costs and the participant would pay others? So again, yeah. So covered under an insurance program, um, that can help reduce costs. Uh, what's the mission of the planner's organization? You know, are you um, are you a nonprofit? Are you trying to to make money? Are you trying to sustain a program so that you do have to charge something, or uh, it, you know, are you simply in it to provide a service and you know you're not interested in charging anything for it at all? And then if there are competitors, what are competitors charging? Because uh, if you're charging more than your competitors, then obviously uh, you're not going to get the uh, you're not going to get the number of participants that you want. And then finally, um, you know, what is the demand for the program? The, so the old supply and demand thing. So if there's uh, a great demand for it, then you know we could charge more if we wanted to. If there's not a great demand, then we're not going to be able to charge uh, a lot. So um, we need to consider those things. All right, then finally, placement or distribution of the program. So, you know, where's the best place to offer it? Uh, are the clients going to be comfortable going there? You know, if we offered a program to low-income people and we said, well, we're going to do it at uh, Georgia College in the Magnolia Ballroom, you know, are the clients uh, going to be comfortable coming on to the Georgia College campus? You know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, probably best to offer the program or the services at a place where they are comfortable going to, maybe a church in their neighborhood or a community center in their neighborhood. How large is your service area? Are you doing things throughout a community or are you doing things, um, you know, throughout a county? Um, you know, if that's the case, then you may want to have multiple distribution points. You know, maybe you want to do it at, um, you know, half a dozen churches throughout the community or, um, you know, at work sites. Um, you know, go to where the people are and where they feel comfortable with. And so we mentioned worksite health promotion. You know, what are some advantages to doing that? Well, a large proportion of the adult population goes to work every day. Uh, they usually have uh, effective internal communication channels to employees. That might be TVs. It might be electronic bulletin boards or bulletin boards. Um, you know, daily announcements, things like that, uh, meetings that they have. Um, so they do a good job of, of communicating internally. Um, you know, usually have some sort of stable support in the form of, you know, human resources or uh, other um, departments within a, a work site. Um, they have the opportunity to create health, uh, healthy environments. You know, they can make those kinds of changes, whether it's in a cafeteria or you know, taking a particular room and turning it into a fitness center, um, you know, eliminating some safety concerns, creating healthier uh, air quality, and so on and so forth. They can do that. And, you know, because people are going there, it uh, can be convenient uh, for employees to access. And then promotion, it's all of the uh, advertising, public relations, uh, media, personal selling, and so on um, that we do in order to uh, create a demand for the product. So, you know, our goal is to turn prospects, uh, prospective participants, into consumer customers or actual participants, and then ultimately to, um, you know, the loyal participants that are going to, you know, come back for more. All right, so here's a few uh, promotion tips. Um, you know, use informative and persuasive communication to make people aware of the product um, that they might have an interest in. Uh, choose an effective and catchy title for your program. So think about a newspaper headline that's designed to grab, grab your attention. So come up with a title that uh, is uh, catchy and uh, is going to get people's attention. Uh, use catchphrases to communicate your message. Uh, you know, we all know the Just Do It, which is the Nike uh, marketing campaign. Uh, Live Healthy Baldwin, as I've shared with you in class, has the uh, catchphrase, making the healthy choice the easy choice. So something that's easy to remember and uh, gets people's attention. 
so here's some titles of uh, health promotion programs that um, students in our class and uh, you know other other folks have come up with um, you know you take a look at these uh, the third one fresh start heart at work is a American Heart Association program uh, we already mentioned uh, or here's one here that's an acronym hey everyone always learns the hard way and the first letters spell health um, live well be well um, United Way at Work, uh, again, that's a, uh, a marketing campaign for trying to get people to contribute to the United Way through their employers. Uh, Start Smart is a, um, an early childhood um, nutrition program. Work Well, and then one that we have here at Georgia College uh, through our Wellness Center is a cancer survivor program called Survive and Thrive. So promotion tips, again, use uh, creative use of acronyms. There's the, uh, uh, the use of the word health. Hey, everyone always learns the hard way. And then other kinds of promotion tips uh, can provide incentives for people to become involved. Um, you know, we do this with uh, 5Ks and bike rides and things like that. Everybody loves a t-shirt or a water bottle. You know, some sort of incentive or a little bit of reward, I guess, for participating. Uh, an employer might offer extra vacation time, uh, free uh, health risk appraisals or health screenings uh, can be um, an incentive for people to participate. Uh, you want to get the endorsement of key people in the organization. If it's a work site, obviously you want the CEO and the director of human resources to be on board with this. Um, you know, distribute... Uh, Things in people's mailboxes or door-to-door -door, um, can be a way of, of reaching folks, uh, particularly in areas where people don't pay a lot of attention to, um, you know, stuff on the internet and social media and things like that. And then personal contact with, contact with somebody who's already involved. Uh, testimonials can be good things that uh, uh, can encourage people to be involved. A mentoring program, so pairing somebody who's been involved in a program with somebody who's new to it can be a good way of getting people involved and keeping them involved. And then think about having some kind of big um, kickoff or ribbon cutting or something, big party, to get a program started. Uh, and you can you know, use the media to help you to promote that. And then on the day of uh, the launch of the program, you have some sort of a big kind of splashy celebration. Um, you know, maybe you get a celebrity to come, a local celebrity, do a ribbon cutting, uh, have the big, you know, bouncy houses and things that, you know, can attract attention, um, music and so on, and, and, and just really kick it off right. All right, and so here's some examples of, of publicity uh, uh, vehicles or tools, obviously brochures and flyers, kind of low impact things, but they do have their place. Uh, billboards, you know, not as expensive as you might think. Um, news releases, press releases, those are pretty much free. You can, uh, you know, go to, to news outlets and say you've got this thing going on and they might treat it as news and give you kind of free advertising for that. Same thing with the newspaper article, you know, tell them that you're doing this, tell them why you're doing this. Um, you know, small town newspapers are always looking for things of local interest and they'll, you know, likely run a story for you a day or two before your event. Uh, radio and TV, um, you know, buying advertising can be expensive, but, um, you know, the FCC tells radio and television stations that, you know, in exchange for their license and their ability to do that stuff, and make money, but they also have to offer what are called public service announcements or PSAs, and so they have to devote a certain amount of airtime to things that are of uh, you know public interest. Now you don't have a lot of control over you know when those things are going to be aired um, and uh, who's going to be listening at the time that they're aired, but they're free, and so um, you know it's it's another another tool. You know, having a website, of course, uh, is another. Uh, you don't want, you're not going to do one of these things. You're going to do a lot of these things. So website is another tool. And of course, you know, we all know about social media like uh, Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest and all of those kinds of things. All right. So bottom line, uh, if you plan it, will they come? Well, uh, the answer to that is yes. If you pay attention to the four P's and by now you ought to know that those are price 
product, placement, and promotion. And you know, I've seen uh, I've seen these things you know put in a circle. If you can and visualize a circle, and then you draw a, a line down the center of the circle, and then you draw another line across the circle, and you put one in each of those four quadrants kind of implies that they're all um, equally important. Um, you know, and I guess truth be known, they probably are equally important, but if you don't do the last one, I'm here to tell you, if you don't promote, 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 you are going to be the person who's standing there at the party, waiting for people to come, everything's ready, and nobody walks through the door. So that's my uh, takeaway, to, or my message to you uh, with you know, as many exclamation marks as I can place behind it, promote, 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 promote. All right, that's all for, uh, for this week, and we will see you in class.